They'll suck out your brains. They'll club you over the head. They'll set you on fire. They'll ruin your pool party. Think you can escape? Ha 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 ha. Foolish mortals. The evil rampaging monsters will find you tonight on USA's Real Wild Cinema. Animate me. And it's me, Miss Bernhard, or should I say Ms. Bernhard. Welcome to Real Wild Cinema, where we always cut out the really bad stuff from our films so that we can cram as much good bad stuff in as possible. Tonight, evil rampaging monsters. Now, these alternative independent filmmakers went where mainstream Hollywood didn't dare to tread. They gave us some of the silliest, scariest, and entertaining monsters in cinema history. They didn't care about fancy special effects and rock-solid plots. They catered to what made their loyal audiences happy. In our first film, Return of Giant Minjin, this huge walking statue is a good guy, although the little guy in the boat might disagree. Have fun. <laughs>
heard my prayer. I thank you so much, God. I love a good samurai tale, don't you? The Japanese filmmakers are so damn kooky sometimes. When we come back, a horrible prehistoric beast crashes a groovy pool party. Gee, I sure know what that's like. The seven foot two inch beast is played by an actor who would later gain fame in those James Bond movies. See ya. Did you ever see a movie called The Last Time I Saw Archie? It was made in 1961 and starred Robert Mitchum and Jack Webb. It's too mainstream for real wild cinema, but has a connection to Ega, the classic we're about to see. The last time I saw Archie was about Arch Hall Sr., a test pilot turned filmmaker, who not only produced and directed Ega, but stars in it too. Hall directed using the name Nichols Merriweather, and he starred using the name William Waters. And if that isn't confusing enough, Ega stars his son, Archie Hall Jr., who appears under his own name, thank God. The script was written for Richard Keel, who later played Jaws in the James Bond movies. I bet the research moles over it before they were stars will be calling tomorrow trying to get their campy little hands on this footage. Think again. It's a real wild cinema exclusive, and I'm unlisted. Enjoy. Ega. <laughs> Climb up their ways and see if the buggy can get through. No, you better stay here. No. There's no use in both of us going. We gotta come back for the buggy anyway. Well, then we'll come back. I'm not going to sit here doing nothing. Oh, women. Look, you stay here with the buggy. Nope. And drive it up to meet me when I give you the signal. That'll save us both a trip. Come on. Well, okay. Okay. Ah, uh, the gun. Toss it. Give me a blast in that horn if you see anything. Don't worry about that.
Roxy? Roxy! Dad! Oh, Dad! Oh. Oh, are you hurt? I think my collarbone's broken. Here, let me help you. How did you get here? Well, we came looking for you, and, and we were both so worried that we didn't know what to do. No, no. Take it easy. Dad! Uh, uh, don't do anything to scare him. Me? Scare him? Smile. What are those? Those are his relatives. They're dead. Yes, apparently for some time. Yiga, cho, cho. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if the sulfur in these walls isn't what's kept these giants alive all these years. Okay, he's waiting for us.
prophecy was real. It says so in the book of Genesis. A little real wild cinema tidbit for you here. They filmed E. Ga in Palm Desert, California. Of course, our real wild cinema producers were guerrilla filmmakers and seldom got permission to shoot on people's property. One day, a curly-haired man, about 70 years old, wandered out into the 120-degree heat and informed the filmmakers they were on his land. Before they could even try to talk their way out of the trouble, the old man said, be my guest, and left as quickly as he arrived. They later found out that the generous old man was Harpo Marx. Harpo Marx, friend to the real wild cinema filmmaker. We'll be right back with a special guest and tonight's feature, The Brainiac. Our guest tonight can be seen in the return of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre as not one, but three leather faces. Robert Jacks. Hi, Robbie. Hi, Sandra. Hi, baby. <laughs> so you play three leather faces? Three. Three. How is that possible? Well, they, they did it in the first one, actually. It's just the budget was so low at that time that they couldn't really afford to do all the masks. They couldn't afford to show the caricatures and everything, and that's why he kind of wanted to make it. 20 years later in the way that he wanted to. You can kind of see the impressions of the, of, the, of the two other, the grandmother and the beautiful woman leather face in the first movie, but really vague. So and also because so of the times. These are distinct. Yeah, they're very distinct. So there must have been some hazards working on this ultra low budget film, because we've talked about it. Yeah, as, as, tell, as a matter of fact, about. just even thinking about um, all the stuff that we're doing and we're, and we're viewing and stuff, yeah. um, they really had it easy. It looked really a lot higher budget. <laughs> then like, but we had, amazingly enough, I mean, uh, this, the, it looks good, but we were operating at such a low budget, it was really, really, really hard, and we did all of our own stunts, and so me and the girls ended up completely bruised, you know, barely able to walk, you know, we were just kept medicated, you know, for the rest of the shoot. We had to confront <laughs> the producer and the director about why our why psychological... Why didn't just revolt? Why didn't the cast just revolt? Because it's, it was a low budget film, you know, you signed on to do it because of that carrot that's hanging out in front of your nose. They play off the eagerness of the actors, and the actors really want to put everything they can into it, and they go out there and they do it. It's real, it's there. I think that's why B-movies B have such an appeal. You know, it's like it's really happening. It is, There's no acting involved. No. You are being truly tortured. Truly tortured. I mean, Sandra, we would go to like the H-E-B in the morning, you know, to get whatever, that, that color lipstick again or whatever, you know, me and, me and Renee, Renee Zellweger, I think that was my name. Right. And, um, People would stare at us in the harsh lighting of that, of that grocery store because she would have like <laughs> uh, bruises from my hands around her neck. But they were they real were all bruises. bruised up. Yeah, completely. We just learned how to flow with it so their heads didn't hit the staircase or the side of the freezer or the meat <laughs> hook or they didn't drown in the pond. They learned, how, they were really smart. Renee Zellweger and Lisa Neumeyer, who are the girls in the film, knew how to throw their bodies with me as we were doing all this stuff. And they knew how to judge the distance between the chainsaw and their bodies so they wouldn't get nicked by it. Honey, can you hang out with us for a little while so you can see uh, the feature? Oh, yeah, I'd love to. Great. Now our feature, The Brainiac. It's about an evil sorcerer who was buried alive in 1661 and vows revenge on the ancestors of those who were killing him. He isn't going to fulfill his curse for 300 years, so I'm not sure how frightening he expects the curse to be. So flash to 1961, and the Brainiac has some big hair and some cool jazz. But when he gets ready to do the dirty deed, his head inflates, his nose lengthens, and his hands become hairy paws. Sound a little like prom night? Try and imagine what it would be like to French kiss the Brainiac. Ouch. <laughs> I shall return to your world within 300 years. When that comet completes its cycle and is once again in these latitudes, I will kill each and every one of your descendants, and I shall expunge your foul lineage from this earth.
forgot. It's a quarter to 12. If we don't hurry, we're going to be late. You two have other plans, it seems. I'm terribly sorry. You see, we're going to talk to the professor at the observatory. It's something important. You must like your work. Don't forget, I chose to be an astronomer. I work in the dark. <laughs> we're looking for a real star, and there are no clouds tonight. Oh, sir, uh, did you see a small aerolite land near here? An aerolite? Yes. No. You appear surprised to see me, my friend. I think I should explain. You see, I always take my walks at this hour of the night. Oh, then let me explain also. You see, sir, we're astronomers. And we were observing a meteor. Oh, but Ronnie, this gentleman doesn't understand a thing that you're saying to him. Young lady, I understand much more than you can imagine. Astronomy is my weakness. As a science, it's most important. And another thing, I studied it for years. I'm quite proficient. Oh, really? Yes. In that case, permit me to offer you my card. Whenever you can visit us, I'd be more than glad to show you my work, sir. Our professor is Harold Milland. I'd be glad to. Well, good night. Good night. Come in. I'm sorry, buddy, but the law says I can't serve you this late. Oh, he's an old friend of mine. Give him one drink, won't you, please? Seems right. You win, but one, and then we close. I got a strange feeling that you and I are met someplace else, honey. But I feel foggy right now. You're real sweet, so please don't think you bother me or anything like that. Since you got here, haven't said one single word to me. But that stare in your eyes says so much to me. To tell you the truth, it makes me feel afraid. Keep staring. I don't want you to stop looking at me. I guess it's just useless.
I've never run across a case like this. The skulls of these two victims show two perforations. Possibly the murderer used an electric drill. Just look at these two orifices. A most astounding thing has occurred in these cases. You see, the cephalic matter was sucked out through these small openings. Got a match for me? Brainiac could learn to keep his tongue to himself. More of Brainiac after this. Right now, we've got the spine-tingling conclusion of the Brainiac! All these decrees here belonged to the Inquisition during the second half of the 1600s, right here. Don Sebastien of Pantoja. You know, in this century, to talk about the Holy Inquisition and the ways they did justice is not what I'd call easy. There exists a legend. Working at this late hour? My daughter, Maria of Pantoja. This is Baron Vitellius of Estera. Baron, how do you do? This Vitellius of Estera must have been one of your ancestors, Baron. No. I never had any ancestors. I was condemned and was burned alive. Forgive me, Baron, but, uh, well, this type of joke is in very poor taste. You know it's impossible. people here were burned, only that doesn't fool me. It's clear that that madman extracted their brains as well. Ah! 
Your forefather was a judge. The Inquisitor Helindo Avivar was at the trial and ordered me to be burned. And you, Ana Luisa Avivar, are to pay the penalty. I'm anxious to get my hands on that information that you said you'd have for us so that we can locate the comet of 1661. You're too impatient. Try to calm down. You'll have to wait another 20 minutes. Meanwhile, I'll go for my medicine. Excuse me, please. I just remembered that you two plan to be married very soon now. Surely you'll permit me on this occasion to give Victoria a jewel. And I suppose we're going to the Baron's house, Chief. You're brilliant. First to headquarters. You like speed so much, so stand on that accelerator. Okay. They're lovely, aren't they? How about you? None can compare with your tender gaze. It's too bad you can't be mine alone. I long to love you and adore you above all, I swear it. But there's no way now. My hate is much stronger than my love, like a master no one can control. I think we can all learn a lesson from part two of the Brainiac. If you ever want to catch a 300-year-old monster and burn him up, always remember to bring two flamethrowers. One of them can always malfunction. By the way, for you purists, we just bypassed the whole clever detective subplot. We've all seen it a thousand times. We can do that here on Real Wild Cinema. We just get crazy and cut the boring stuff out. Coming up, more with our guest and a film that Disney doesn't want you to see, Stripper and the Beast.
We're back with my wonderfully talented friend, Robbie Jacks, star of the upcoming Leatherface. That's right. Three of them. A triptych. Three and one and one and three. A trilogy <laughs> of, ter of terror, <laughs> minus Karen Black. Now, did you go to see these movies when you were a kid? Were you obsessed with these kind of films? Um, actually, I saw a lot of them on, on late night television, because it's the only time they would let them on. So. Um, I watch them always, you know, because in the TV guide that always lists horror. Horror, you know, I know, exactly. And that's the main one you rivet on, so you'd stay up and watch those, you know, consecutively. That was These a great, are, great comfort, those movies. Yeah, it later, was. Wasn't it? Like it when was. You, you when loved your parents it. went out or you were, you were left alone or with a babysitter or, or something. Or you're just up alone with the TV on. You're I not know. supposed to be up and, you, and you're watching it and, and you are. It's, it's endorphins, you know. Things just creep you out and the tension builds and you just Everybody's love Everybody's asleep it in the child. house and you feel like completely alone. Yeah. And I terrified. Think, I think B-movies capture that kind of magic mm. from childhood in that kind of a way. They really do. Because they play off your imagination so much, and then it's so campy. Like, Ega has an Ega dance when the girl's by the pool and dancing like, like, <laughs> like that, you know, and Ega shows up, you know, it's a boy meets girl story. <laughs> That's essentially oh, what, what it is. what a boy. What a boy. Those Woo! hands. Did you see the size oh, of those hands? Those big, hairy hands. That's funny. right. Big hands, big giant. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say Ega is your favorite? Uh, well, I don't know. Um, the one, uh, is, it the, is it titled uh, Brainiac? Is that Brainiac. the actual title? Oh, yeah. Okay, the, the tongue Brainiac. action. Okay. When <laughs> the that, tongue action we've always dreamed of. The tongue action and the flashlight lighting. Those are the two things. Whenever he, then he would like, <laughs> they, just, they just strap some flashlights right. in front of the camera. They didn't care. <laughs> and then it would go away. But the tongue, I mean, <laughs> talk about not coming up for air. I know. That's like a 20-inch tongue. It was amazing. <laughs> That's a fantastic you touch, movie. You can touch the tip of your nose. <laughs> I can touch, touch the tip of mine. But he can reach all the way to yours. But I love that kind of stuff. Honey. That's the kind of thing that should come back, I think. I hate to cut it short. Oh. I'm, as a matter of fact, I'm really not cutting it short. I'm <laughs> elongating it. But I'm so glad you came up from Austin. Oh, me too. I'm so glad to be and here. I'm thrilled that you were with me tonight. Thanks, Sandy. Love you. Love you too. Yes, you. Our next flick is actually weird. No, even weirder than the rest. It's a stag film from the early 60s. A nurse decides to torment a tied-up beast by stripping for him. Well, our mischievous little stripper should have worked out at the gym for a few months before she shot this thing. You'd have to believe that the poor beast is so tortured that he breaks free to force her to put her clothes back on. You be the judge. Here's Stripper and the Beast. Let's move further into the realm of horror. She could change her clothes in the twinkling of an eye. But no, there's a man lying there, even if he is a monster. Why not torment him a bit with an innocent little strip tease? After all, plenty of girls strip for middle-aged industrial magnets that are uglier than he is.
monster gets excited, wriggles out of his bonds, breaks the ropes, and frees himself. Remember the old saying, never underestimate the power of woman. More evil rampaging monsters after these commercials. Fasten your seatbelts, it's gonna be a bumpy ride. Wild Cinema offers you tonight's outrageous feature, Brainiac, uncut, uncensored, and unbelievable at the low price of $19.95. Be the envy of your friends with the Monster A Go-Go t-shirt for $15 or the Real Wild Cinema t-shirt for $15. Official Real Wild Cinema membership newsletter and complete video catalog for only $5 or free with order of t-shirt or video. Call 1-800-571-4763 to order now. age when these films were new, not all of the great horror shows took place on the screen. Showmen used to travel the country during the 50s and 60s doing live acts in between movie showings. Here are some of the actual coming attraction trailers as well as a trailer from one of these live shows. It takes just 10 seconds for the flesh eaters to strip the last bit of flesh from any living thing. want flesh, any kind of flesh. And once they sense it, they lead their way to anything that comes between them and their meat. They stood alone, surrounded by the most abominable threat ever faced by human beings. Don't touch those things! is watching, watching a diabolical plan to unleash a horde of faceless monsters on the helpless world. One man against the strongest, cruelest, most dangerous team of evildoers ever conceived by the brain of a power-mad mastermind. Super Argo and the faceless giants the eyes of Super Argo are watching, searching, asking, who is the mad scientist? What is the secret power he controls? Can the strength of Super Argo overcome these mysterious creatures in their insane bid to rule the world? Super Argo and the Faceless Giants. Who is the traitor? lies in the action-packed, thrill-filled, spectacular adventures of Super Argo and the Faceless Giants. I don't know about you guys, but I feel like I've been sucked dry tonight. I'm going to go home, replenish my fluids, and eat a nice piece of fresh shark. You know it's good brain food. Tonight has been one of the greatest nights of my career, and I'll be back next week on Real Wild Cinema, where that night will be the greatest night of my career as well. I'm Sandra Bernhard. Good midnight to you.